All right, so I know we all wanted to be on this podcast and talk about in-season training because that's something that's a little bit of, uh, there's some misconceptions out there. So I guess first things first, I want to kind of clarify what are some of those biggest misconceptions that we've seen as coaches and then kind of go through from kind of practical standpoint, like how should athletes be, and specifically pitchers, be thinking about their training in season, their throwing in season, you know, talk about relievers versus starters, and just kind of go through some of the nuance there. But again, first question, like what are some of the biggest misconceptions you guys have seen with athletes that we worked with, especially remotely in season? So in my uh, opinion, the biggest two were basically both guys on each side of the spectrum where guy one is like, it's still the off season. I'm just going to rip like heavy lifts, like nothing's changed. And guy two is like, I don't need to lift for three months. Like I'll still be fine. There's like no like middle ground. It's either been, I'm all in like still off season time or I'm not going to lift at all. Yeah, I think with a lot of guys, what we see alluding to that point is either they determine that they're still in off-season mode, and then there's no segue into in-season volume and translating their workload successfully, both weight room, on-field, etc. And then you have the other guy who's just like, well, now my development's finished, I'm taking it to the field. So then they just shut that mindset completely off, and obviously there's a middle ground. And I think something we see a ton is guys have a sweet spot of what area they're trying to continue to develop in. If you're throwing the ball insanely well, plyo routines are good, long toss is good, mound is good, etc. Maybe we shift, you know, your weekly schedule a bit more towards the strength side of things and really figure out what your developmental path is moving forward. But either shutting it off completely or, you know, one way or the other, that's where we see a lot of, you know, unfortunate scenarios unravel. Yeah, guys just don't know how to regulate their week, I think. They're just like you know, all the scheduling, like practices, games, everything like piles up on them. They don't know like where, like they can mix in other things. Right, and I, I think from my standpoint, like that's definitely more common with the younger athletes. The guys who've been through it, the, the MLB veterans, like they really have their routines dialed in. They know when they need to shift from strength mode to power mode to maintenance mode in season. They know how to gradually on-ramp their throwing volume and, and how to kind of pace themselves through spring training. They don't just come out firing, you know, max effort every single day, trying to impress everybody from day one. Um, but again, it's the young guys where we have to kind of hold their hand and guide them and say like, okay, this is the time to kind of downregulate the lifting volume a little bit, shift the emphasis there, uh, recognize the workload that you may or may not have in season. Uh, I know we were talking about this before the podcast, but some guys, you know, will have a huge workload from the very start of the season and the other guys are gonna be just riding the bench, especially in the college and high school level for the entire season. And so maybe they can stay in more off season mode but uh, to that point you know specifically just talking about college and high school players to start here and then we can talk about pros how do you kind of separate the what category those those guys fall into uh, as far as workload and as far as you know what type what should their focus be in season so i've like separated it into the three categories of like performance where you're playing every day or like you're a starter a uh, developmental where you're probably not going to get any innings and then like some hybrid focus where you're a reliever you're like nine to 12 on a depth chart and you like basically just need to be available and like always ready. But the easier two is gonna be the performance and the developmental where you know, like either your focus is gonna be peaking for game day or you're not gonna play at all and your job is to get better at the skill so you can like eventually play and be that performance category. Like I think that's the identification process that guys need ahead of time to like be able to know what their weekly schedule is gonna be, right. especially in like college and high school. Cause like guys don't really know and you have guys that are never seeing the field that are still like, gotta be ready for game day. And it's like, you just wasted three months of your season, basically just preparing for nothing because you're not gonna play. And I know I fell into that rut a little bit. And part of it is on the player, but then part of it is also on, some coaches aren't necessarily that transparent and honest up front about where you fall on the depth chart. So I know in my case, there were a couple of years in college where like, I really should have redshirted, but I didn't really understand what my options were. And I was being told that like, I have to be ready, have to be ready, have to be ready. and then. I throw three innings for the entire year and they're all mop-up innings. Like there wasn't any point to me, for me to not redshirt two of those years for, for me in college. But a lot of coaches won't be transparent about that because they don't, they want to make sure like in a worst case scenario, they might have their number nine reliever available. So part of it does fall on the player, part of it does fall on the coach, but it's almost better to have like a very clear cut, like this is my role for the season versus when you're kind of in that gray area, you always have to be ready. So you really can't focus as much on you know, maybe your your pregame bullpens or pregame long toss or getting after in the weight room as much as you'd want to. Something I always thought was odd but kind of comical is in college, I felt like guys never touched the mound. Yeah. Like if you're a reliever who might get some mop-up innings, like 
you're like, oh, I, I really shouldn't touch the mound. I need to be fresh. Like I'm going to regulate my long toss intensity, et cetera. So I'm good for the game. But then you look in pro ball and I think like 70 to 80% of relievers nearly touch the mound for five to eight bullets per day. Like it's insane the amount uh, that professional guys are throwing off the slope versus I know just observing in college, it was like, I'm just going to be on permanent standby without touching the slope, which obviously is not going to help in that skill specific development. Yeah. And I think too, like you're talking about the college level, like those freshmen, you're probably not going to see the field in the weekend series. And like knowing that ahead of time, like you can plan your week around Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, we have a big series coming up. I'm a freshman. I haven't played like all year probably going to be a decent opportunity for me to get some training in and not really need to focus on playing games. So it's just like shifting your schedule around when you might play, I think, like midweek opportunities, like finding out those like areas where you might be able to see the field. But I think like, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth inning, if you're a reliever of like a weekend series as a freshman, like unless you're one of the top dogs, probably not going to play and use that as an opportunity. So it's basically just like finding your opportunities to actually get work done. And to Zombra's point about how in pro ball there's like a different culture around just throwing off the mound a lot. I think part of that for me, and it was like a wake up call when I got to pro ball, is the catchers are way more receptive to that as well. Like in college, the catchers are like, I'm not, I'm not doing that, like screw this. In pro ball, it's like, yeah, whatever, like, whatever you need. Like everyone wants to get off the mound and throw like a short box just about every day. They have five, 10 guys that, are, that want to throw a short box. In college, it's like, no, you're wasting my time. Like I don't want to deal with, this isn't like what I signed up for. So just like the attitude can be very, very different between levels. But part of that is to, you know, pro catcher's credit, like they take their job a little bit more seriously as far as what they're doing. You know, a lot of the pro pitching coaches understand really the importance of high frequency mound work or just getting off the slope regularly. Right. And, and monitoring intensity and volume within that. Like I, I also will say that uh, to your point, I think catchers are receptive in pro ball because they're like, oh, this guy's going to hop up on the mound. Give me like three to four of each pitch and he's done. Right. He's hopping on, he's hopping off. And I think regulating that if you're a college kid specifically, like that's a powerful tool that honestly puts you way ahead of the curve relative to everybody else. Because I know for a fact, at least a lot of guys I was playing with and how a lot of guys are currently, if you're a guy who's not on the field competing, there's no shot you're touching the mound three three times a week. Yeah, I think Declan said that too. Like his velo went up last year when he started throwing every day. Like towards the end of the season, he would get off the mound for like, three to five pitches, just like work up to 90 and then just like be ready, even if you need to pitch in a game. I think that's where like the workload over time helps guys just like, you know, pro ball seasons, six months, like that's the difference between that and college. Like over time, you can build up your workload where you're thrown off the mound three to five times a week, you know, working up to maybe like close to a peak velo, but just like being ready whenever yeah. to throw. I, I would argue that the, the velo increase there probably isn't necessary from the workload. Like if you threw those five or 10 pitches a day on flat ground versus on the mound, he's getting a similar workload, but there's a comfort level from the specificity of being on the mound. Mechanically like too. It, like, uh, I think it was uh, Smoltz, I posted a clip of Smoltz saying like, the mound is your office. Like you need to spend time in your office versus throwing on flat ground. And that was several years ago. Like I had that epiphany, like why even throw flat grounds? Like maybe flat grounds serve a purpose at some point in like the off season on ramp, maybe at some point in, the, in a rehab progression. But once you're ramped up to the mound, once you're in in season mode, like, spend time in the office i mean like yeah mccullers will say right he doesn't even throw on flat ground like breaking yep. balls just rips him off the mound like i've had guys say like cutter looks good on flat ground today wasn't great on the mound it's like why does it matter what it looks like on flat ground yeah. if it doesn't yeah. look it, good on the mound and that's like uh from a mechanical fall perspective too especially going more to pro ball side guys who throw a ton of breaking balls tend to have a later arm which of course if you're on flat ground the arm's going to be really really late and then you go to the mound, it'll be a bit more on time. Like I know we've posted uh, Justin Verlander clips in the past of right. how ugly it's, it is on yeah. flat ground. But again, that specificity of it and for pitch shapes and also arm action timing principles, getting on the slope is certainly the best bang for your right. buck there. So it, go, it can go both ways. Like you can either have everything really synced up on the mound, breaking ball, everything sharp on the mound, and then it's kind of ugly on flat ground. Like Verlander, which I argue that's what you want. Like you'd rather, if you're going to choose one or the other, you'd rather be synced up on the mound. Or you can have, I'll have guys where like, if they do too much flat ground work earlier on the off season, they spin a bunch of breaking balls on flat ground all the time. That gets really sharp. And then when they get on the mound, they lose it. And so it's like, well, if we're going to, if we're going to specialize in one of the two, let's specialize what you're actually, where you're going to be throwing all your pitches in a game. And maybe we don't spin as many breaking balls on flat ground at the end of catch play. Maybe we don't spend, you know, spend five minutes 
throwing change-ups, throwing sliders, throwing breaking balls to a partner just standing up. Spend those same 20 throws, 25 throws, 70%, whatever it is, off a mound, just get comfortable on the slope. That's another big thing too, I like to talk about a little bit, it's like where the volume's going, like where's my focus gonna be like volume-wise, like why not spend on the mound if I'm like gonna make 50 throws today, let's make 20 of them off the mound right. and not like 30 after catch play, like have a, your partner get down. Like, Yeah, we, we talked about different, different factors that can contribute to your overall workload a little bit before this. And a lot of coaches, um, you know, I know for me in college, like uh, one of my coaches in particular, like he really only looked at in-game workload. And so, you know, I remember one weekend in particular where I was up and down like the entire weekend. I never got in, the, in any of the games over the entire three game series, but I probably threw a hundred pitches that weekend in the bullpen. And so just constantly getting blue balled and it's Monday and he, like Monday or Tuesday, you know, he wants me to throw live or an inner squad. I'm like, my arm is hanging. And he's like, what are you talking about? You didn't pitch in this weekend. Like, so that was eye opening for me in terms of there's a ton going on from a workload standpoint that doesn't even factor in the actual in-game workload. So, I mean, obviously any sort of short box or bullpen volume, uh, obviously any sort of pregame long toss or catch play that you're doing, obviously any sort of plyos, like some guys don't think of plyos as throwing. It blows my mind that they, like you're still throwing, you're throwing an implement. Like how does that not compute to you as throwing volume? But some guys will spend 15 minutes throwing 100, 150 plyo throws before they even go into catch play. Then they'll long toss to max distance five times a week in season. And then they'll throw 40, 50 pitches in the bullpen because they, they feel like they need that much volume just to be able to go in the game. And then they'll obviously throw however much they throw in a game. And so this workload just keeps stacking on top of itself. So um, Devin, what are some of the strategies you, you might use for guys where you're, you're thinking like, hey, maybe this is a workload issue. How do you kind of get through to them? So we use like my fitness pal for nutrition, like in my opinion, using like pulse for a guy has been like huge just to see like the workload. Doesn't necessarily have to be like a, let's use the pulse every day for like four months, like get dependent on it, but just like a, you're feeling like you're hanging, your velo has been the same or like a little bit down on 10 days. Let's see what the rest of your week looks like. And I've had guys wear it for a week and just like see that they're making 60 high effort throws on their recovery days. Or SAP was just like, I never realized I'm making like 80 plyo throws. And then I go to like baseball and it's just like, I only count the baseball throws and it might be like 40 baseball throws, mm -hmm. but I made 80 plyo throws. Mm -hmm. So like having an idea of what the weekly workload looks like so you're peaking for game time. I think like you did it with a couple of your guys this off season, just as like a, a check-in, just being like, you know, we don't have to like use this for extended period of time, but let's see what your week looks like because there's a reason that like you're not peaking for pen day, game day, things like that. Right. It, on the pro side, I think we find guys always trying to work on something a bit too much on recovery days. And then all of a sudden arm speed spikes and like it's not a recovery day right. anymore. Um, Going back off of that to like high school volume, because I know we talked a little bit about college here, but thinking back to high school for a two-way player, as we look at this, it's like these guys do not need a lot. Like you think about the number of throws you make if you're a two-way kid in high school, if you're pitching, you got pregame long toss, if you're going to play shortstop throwing six to eight bullets across the infield in between every inning. Double header sometimes. You're yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy the volume they have. And to regulate that is really important. Um, and I'll kind of... Uh, pump Devin's ego a little bit here. But I think Devin's really good from a monitoring volume intensity standpoint. And something I've tried to do with a lot of pro guys from him is is really look at their plyo routine because like you said, they don't count plyos oftentimes. And I've really tried to get off that to find guys three to four anchor drills, you know, two to three throws per drill, whatever weight you want to throw, I don't care. Whether that's a one pound, seven ounce, five ounce, doesn't matter to me. Um, but go ahead and make your two to three throws with that anchor drill, get the feel you want to get and get off and then go to your catch play just to monitor volume that way. Cause I think one thing we see on the pro side a ton is guys start chasing after feels and then you look up and you're, you know, 40, 50 throws deep in plyos and they have no recollection of that. Right. They're, they're completely blind to it. And a lot of, a lot of that is, is that they're still in this, this off season mentality of, Hey, I need X number of throws or I need, I need, they don't realize that like, Hey, I need to replace if I'm going to suddenly add all this in-game workload, I need to back off somewhere else. And so where do you back off from? Well, you have to be able to back off from usually the plyo routine. So just communicating to them, it's like purely like the bare minimum that you need to feel warm, feel loose, and then go into your catch play. We talked so about that. In like it might the, be 10 throws. Yeah. It might be 15 throws. Big league relievers aren't, you know, throwing 100 plyo throws. 
before every outing. Even they would just they wouldn't starters last. too. Like with Mitch, it was just like get your feel, like find your feel for the day. If it's going to be the Kikuchi drill or like a random like the figure eight drill, do like three to five of those. Get whatever feel you need to get, and go to like a baseball, go to the mound, like get your work in there because so many guys will chase a feel for so long yeah. on like a moderate day and then not realize like you just spent you know yeah, yeah like yeah. Said 40 yeah. I mean I had this talk with an athlete uh, yesterday. Because he, he's a guy, um, pretty complex delivery, long levers, has a lot going on, and he has a ton of mechanical things that he wants to work on. Okay, but by the same token, he wants to knock down these three mechanical dominoes and see how it translates to the mound, velo, etc. But it's like, hey man, if we're going to chase after these like three to four things, couple lower half, couple arm action principles, if you're going to make 40 to 50 throws in plyos, I'm not super confident in your ability to be fresh and feeling good on the mound. Right. So you've got you've got to touch on that because guys will get lost in it as they chase those yeah. kind of and patterning things. It can be difficult from a coaching standpoint to to know like how to how exactly to prescribe like plyo volume for example or long toss volume because it really should be more field based I, in a sense like just saying like two sets of ten of each ball of each of seven different drills like guys want to see like this very like rigid linear like just tell me the routine and I'm gonna do it. But it doesn't really work like that in reality. You're going to have days where you feel more recovered, days where you feel less recovered, and you really should be doing five throws or no plyos, or and days where you feel fresh. You know you're not going to go in the game for the next three days, and maybe you you know extend it out a little bit. You do a few more throws, but have you guys found any success with how to communicate that auto regulation principle to guys? And will you even like bother putting like sets and reps in there, or will you just kind of leave it open ended as far as like a feel based thing? Something I've like played around with is mostly on like recovery days, just being like you're limited to the amount of throws like you're gonna make like to 30. If whether it's baseball, whether it's plyo, like if you're gonna spend some time in the plyo wall, let that be the throwing that you're doing for the day. Like I'm I'm fine if you don't want to throw a baseball after that. Like throw some plyos, get your feels. Like limit it on the recovery days because I think that's where we get into where guys are like spiking workload on random days, like recovery, moderate days, that's usually where the unplanned like sessions are gonna happen mm -hmm. where they're like, hey, I was feeling something out, so I spent 10 minutes on this like back leg arm action thing and you're just like, okay, uh, we got a pen like tomorrow and you just you know, made 200 right. throws, so. Yeah, you, do, you, don't, you don't really see pitching coaches abusing guys' arms to like the tune of 150 pitch outings anymore. No. Like it, it occasionally does happen, especially in like random, the random high school level, like it, it can happen, but there's a little bit more awareness about that side of the workload equation now, but it's it's almost more like, you know, players shooting themselves in the foot on like, just trying to get, it's the guys that are really motivated trying to get better on yeah. their light days, on their recovery days, they're just doing too much. I know another example would be like, guys who had success with long toss in the off season, they're really bought into long toss. And so they like, in their mind, they need to like hit that max long toss distance every single day to feel like, okay, I have it. And it becomes like this mental crutch. It's like, it's, my velo is going to disappear if I don't throw to like 330 feet every single day. So part of what I have to do for some of those guys is like have them not do that for a day, have them see like, look, my velocity is still exactly where it was. And then realize like, okay, let's, let's adjust the dial to like minimum effective dose. There's like in lifting and anything really, there's maximum recoverable volume. That's like the absolute limit you could possibly recover from. And any more than that, you just like can't, can't perform. But then there's minimum effective dose, and that's like the minimum you could possibly do without everything just starting to degrade. And I would argue in season, you want to be way more towards the minimum effective dose. Like if you can just lift once a week or twice a week, you know, a couple heavy sets and maintain your strength completely, wouldn't that be better than lifting like at the absolute most you possibly could get away with in season to where if you did like one more rep, you're just like, you start to decrease performance. Yeah. So there, there's a window there where, in which you mm -hmm. can perform I would argue we probably want to err more on the side of minimum effective dose, though. Because you're peaking for a game day. And I think that's the biggest exactly. difference between college and pro is, like, you have guys that aren't going to play in college. At the pro level, you have to be ready to go, mm -hmm. like, when your name's called. Like, it doesn't matter if you don't feel great. Like, you're on the mound. So let's, like, get ready for game day. I think you've got, got good experience with that, just, like, organizing your week, like, training schedule to be like, okay, I have to be ready off the mound these days. What do I need to do leading up to that to be ready for game day? Yeah, exactly. I think the minimum effective dose is, is the perfect kind of saying there to frame it. You look on the pro side, if guys want to get in upper, lower, whether it's a total body. And I feel like majority of really successful high-end relievers, they just basically split it up three to four days a week, upper, lower, however they want to kind of split their workload there. But they hit the minimum effective dose. 
and they know they're going to recover and be fine for a game, and they just continue doing that for 162 games. And I think that aids in recovery a ton. Um, going back to the throwing side of things, I always leave it open-ended. Um, one thing that I've been trying to do a lot lately is also think about a little more, uh, if we're trying to be a little more loose, kind of joint centrated with uh, throwing related volume or muscly to kind of get that load musculature wise. So overload, underload, I don't prescribe what they're gonna do. One day they might feel really good whipping a five ounce plyo around, the next day they might wanna be a little lighter with a one pound ball for five throws. So I leave that completely open-ended to how they're feeling on a given day. Obviously, if he just had an outing, maybe I don't want him being super loose, whippy, quick with a five ounce ball, but I leave that completely up to them, hit the feel of what you wanna do, and then move on. A lot of the, like, the, the pulse prescription is for guys that have had struggles with like, you know, not peaking on game day. So like those are, that only application would happen. And I think when you're taking the whole picture into account for guys that are like not having success, like right now, a lot of guys like they're, they're asking you come up to you like, why is my velo down? Is it something I'm doing mechanically? And like you as a coach can look at it and say, nothing's really going on differently. Let's take a, a look at the bigger picture, like nutrition season, like anything going on workload wise. Like there are more factors than just like mechanics for a lot of guys. I don't think they realize in season going into like overall workload. Yeah, we can kind of touch on the, the psychology of, of the, you know, especially like the inexperienced, like high school or college uh, pitcher. A lot of times, like before the season actually starts, there's this like overconfidence. There's, you know, there can be like, oh, I don't like need, you know, I don't need a coach anymore. Like I'm, I'm not in like velo phase. I'm not in like strength building phase. I can do this on my own. All I, you know, I got this. And they think that like they don't need any help. They just can. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. It's going to just be like smooth sailing, perfect scenario every single outing. And then, what ultimately ends up happening is things never go perfect. If everything ever always been perfect, like we'd all be all stars every year. Like every MLB guy would be an all star. Like it never happens. Even the very best guys that we work with, like they'll have a little knee tweak or an adductor strain, or mm -hmm. they'll lose the vert on their their fastball, not quite know what's going on. Their command will be a little bit iffy for a couple weeks. So that's ultimately what, what does happen in reality. And like, we, we know that as coaches because we've now, we've, you know, coached hundreds and hundreds of guys through it. But in that moment, they're feeling really good at the end of the off season. Maybe they're watching this right now and they're very confident going to the season. What would you say is to your athlete if they're like, yeah, I, I don't really feel like I need you guys at this point, or just, I don't really feel like I need coaching help right now. I would, I would say that all of the smartest people I know in this industry if they are still throwing and actively trying to develop themselves, use somebody from the outside to assist them. Like you can't see yourself through that lens. Um, like myself, you, Devin, when he throws, I ask Devin about my throwing all the time. I'll ask you stuff about my throwing. Uh, like Dean Jackson, we talk about throwing all the time, utilizing Nevin on the PT side. Like we put people in our corner who can observe us from a different lens and kind of hold us accountable there. So I, I think, you're pretty negligent if you think you can problem solve it all yourself and see yourself through a certain lens. It's why you've got to use your outside help with that. I've honestly been on the boat recently too, where I, as from a remote perspective, like I see the bigger picture. Like I think sometimes guys in season with their like kitchen coach that they're seeing every day is going to harp on them. Like, because I see them every day, like let's work on something new every day. Mm -hmm. And like as a remote coach, it's kind of like, let's take a step back, see the bigger picture. You don't need to be changing stuff up every day. So it's more of like from a management perspective in season, it's just like you're managing the guys like weekly workload, like training wise, kind of throwing wise, you can see the bigger picture instead of just being like a pitching coach that has like 30 guys right in front of them every day. And it's tough to like manage each guy and like what they're doing. But like from a remote perspective, you can see like, okay, this is kind of what your week looks like. Let's not go crazy, like trying to change things mechanically. Like we're in a good spot right now. Like don't just keep, you know, digging yourself a deeper hole. And I think that's where like talking to Mitch, he, he said he ran into issues like when his velo started to go down, instead of taking a step back and like working mm -hmm. back towards what he was doing well, he kept digging himself deeper into like holes. And so like a remote coach can just be like, hey, let's take a step back. This is what we're doing when you're having success. Let's not like dig ourselves a deeper hole and then kind of spend months trying to figure stuff out. Whereas like, you know, you as a, as a athlete and also coach have been through it. And I think you made the point that like an issue that had taken you three months, you can take like a week with a guy now, right. like you've done so much work, you know, training throwing wise to be like, okay, this issue now takes me a week to fix. It's not like a three month, like keep digging ourselves a hole. We know how to fix it. Right. I think that's such an important point as far as like removing the emotion from 
any sort of speed like we already know going in there's going to be speed bumps we tell athletes before they even sign up with us there's going to be plateaus like no one just gains a mile an hour a, a month for forever like no one is it, there's going to be plateaus we already know going in from our standpoint so when that does happen like we can approach it from an objective problem solving okay is this recovery is this mechanics is this the mental side like but a lot of athletes the the natural instinct they have a bad outing they give up like you know they lose the game on a on a home run or something they make a bad pitch and the, even this is even for big leaders and they're like they they come the next day they're freaking out they're like what do i need to change and the the instinct is always i have to change something but to your point like sometimes the answer is yes you need to change something if the trend is just continu continuously you know negative but other times like you made a bad pitch like you gave up a bomb you're facing big league hitters like it's it's, it's baseball it's okay like yeah. you you executed a change up low and away and like Bryce Harper took you deep like it is what it is like we don't need to radically change your leg lift or you know change the grip on your change up and so part of what i view our job is you know in season is really just helping provide a little bit more calm and consistency versus they're going to be going through this roller coaster of emotions where we can kind of take a step back bird's eye view and approach it from a much more calm, unbiased, objective standpoint. Yeah, great, great point on the, like you've had so, well, unfortunately you've had so <laughs> many injuries that you can problem solve things very quickly. And like even myself, I've, I've had a tricep head issue for like a month now. And I was talking to Devin some about this, but like if I was my own coach right now, I would be saying like, hey, take a week, chill, and we'll get back into it. But meanwhile, my ego gets involved and I just wanna push, push, push. And, you know, ultimately with our athletes, the reason why we are so, you know, confident and we really pride ourselves in problem solving that quickly is because in a big league season, something that lingers from a week to a month to two months is absurd value. And so we're always trying to kind of nip that in the bud and, you know, really get ahead of that. Yeah, I, I would argue, and I, I tell my guys this, is that in season, our job is actually more important versus off season. Like some people think, oh, just like, I just need a VLO program in the off season and like that's that's it that's a, that's the only value and like I'm going to be fine in season I can figure it out it's like no in season you actually have way less room for error in the off season if you tweak your hamstring doing sprints or you tweak your adductor or whatever like you can afford to take three four weeks to get that right in season like you know the clock is ticking so you can't afford to to re-aggravate it like I'm thinking back to like Will Vest this past year he tweaked his tweaked his adductor we had to navigate through that you know along with his team staff and you know, he was back a week and a half, two weeks later, but that could have very easily turned into like, well, you know, he was on the fence about just throwing through it. So that was, I was very adamant, like we cannot just throw through this risk of getting significantly worse. So being able to navigate those issues as they come up, Clay Holmes, you know, had some knee stuff, you know, problem solving why exactly that was happening, torquing into the, into the ground on his back foot when he comes set, like being able to problem solve, solve that stuff as it comes up and nip it in the bud early is extremely valuable in season. Whereas in the off season, you kind of have more room for error. You can kind of like run into certain issues, problem solve it, and it's not as big of a deal. And and with soft tissue related injuries, like you just alluded to, how many of those turn into like, oh, three days, yeah. seven days, we'll give you two weeks off. And how many of those just linger and linger? And I think the one thing that is great about us is we have so many coaches and even ourselves with different expertise areas where it can be something that's multifaceted. It can be from the weight room. It can be from throwing related stuff. It could be from recovery modalities, nutrition, the overarching things that we all get to see from the outside as coaches. Whereas if you're a player in the trenches, sometimes you're gonna to fail to really see that. So your like, mind is gonna immediately go to like, what is wrong in my mechanics? But it might not be mechanical at all. It might be like, you're on a road trip, you didn't sleep the night before and your velo's down. It might be, you know, you have a blister. It might be like something nutritionally, like there's a ton of different factors. Like it might be that you lifted really heavy the day before when you shouldn't have, and so now you're fatigued. So again, you gotta be able to zoom out, see the big picture, see all the factors and then zoom back in and address whatever the specific cause is. And those, those fascial lines, things we're seeing more and more with guys, I know this off season alone, I had a minimum of five athletes now who have had back leg adductor issues and then lead oblique. Obviously we know that fascial line exists. And so then how do we build a program around that? Both from a plyo standpoint, corrective, if they need to do a certain fascial routine to get that arranged correctly. Like we see these correlations time and time again. It's like for Vess, for instance, it's like, I know his adductor had an issue, which then obviously the back legs gonna function differently. If he starts rotating different, now he could have an oblique thing. But if you don't nip that in the bud, that could just linger on and on. And so our ability to see that and program for it from again, the soft tissue, corrective side, mobility side, 
regulate their plyo work, analyze their throwing to make sure they're still moving how they do when they're best. All those things are so important. I think there's like a level of like objectivity that we have to it, like zooming out. Like, yeah, I know you're like freaking out right now. Don't worry. We have had two other athletes like have this similar issue like a couple months ago and using other athletes like with adductor issues or, or things like that, routines that have worked, like being able to program those. And you guys talked about like the injuries, but also like in-season data, like things that like can come up like Mitch last year, you know, throwing cut fastballs and like having to make that adjustment middle of the season. Like maybe, you know, if that isn't offered to him, like he's not a big leaguer this year, like mm -hmm. something like that. Just like little things could be anything from like injuries to data to like what your week looks like. Like it's not just pitching mechanics as like a, a throwing right. coach. It's like, what does everything look like? Specifically with the injury thing though, you know, I think something that's not talked about nearly enough is athletes don't want to mention to their coach in, in a normal scenario when something doesn't feel right. Like we, Mitch mentioned this in his podcast, but like we are directly aligned with like, we're not, if he tells us like, or one of our guys tells us that their arm is like hanging, we're not like immediately going and snitching to their like coach that his arm's hanging. It's like, we're, we're on your side. We got to figure this out. But the answer might be like, you, hey, you need to go tell your coach because he's going to put you in the game and you're going to go through 110 pitches and like you're going to make this worse. So ultimately, like we need the player to be comfortable talking to us or talking to their coach about how they're feeling. That's the only way you can really make informed decisions about workload, about, you know, whether you should take a day off or push a start back or what, what have you. Most of the time, it's like, again, the ego kicks in. They don't want to admit that they're hurt. They're just like, I'm just going to throw and see what happens. And so, again, like most of the time things get worse when you try to throw through pain throw through discomfort versus taking a step back problem solving it with somebody who's in your corner who has a line belief a line belief system and it isn't just going to like cut you because now you're like the injury prone guy which unfortunately is is the culture in a lot of places you just don't want to admit that you're hurt yeah the communication i think is big for you to like be able to communicate with athletes and communicate with like their coach specifically at tread like I would say like I probably talk to most of my guys at least like once a week and it's not even just like you know how are you doing baseball wise it's like kind of checking on everything just to see if like hey maybe this influenced like your week like maybe you ran into an injury this is what we need to do but also like you know we're, we're talking constantly so it's like I have a track record of what the history looks like which I think is huge too for guys especially off season transitioning to in season in terms of what we did well but also like what can we do if things don't go well 100 percent and just the, the fact that like you need to you need to be able to get into the athlete's head in season and talk to them and understand what where their mentality is if they have a bad outing like what was the, what was the focus what were you feeling like you really can't see everything that you need to see just from video and just from a stat line just from like just from their mechanics like that's that's not nearly enough like i need to know like was your focal point different i need to know was like this is your first night game you've been pitching during the day was there a huge crowd that was kind of like were you feeling like a little anxious did you have too much caffeine before the game and so you're jittery like there's so much stuff you don't you don't know unless you actually take the time to on a very regular basis if it's weekly if it's every other week if it's with most of my guys after every single outing we'll have some sort of outing review go through their data go through their video hop on a call yeah but it's it's the getting into their mindset piece of it that's so important that's so overlooked you can't just see that from a stat line yeah there's there's also tiny things that we can figure out through those conversations i know for instance um i myself have had this and i had an athlete last year that had it where he threw in a game i remember looking at his data um his i mean i hate using spin rate but it is a pretty good injury indicator uh, so his spin rates were down like five to ten percent or so um, his movement profiles were completely off uh, I did not watch the outing. I went back and tried to watch it on my own, and he was complaining of some forearm issues. So, turns out it was raining in that specific game. Of course, a Major League Baseball is slick, as is. What's the compensation going to be? Oh, well, he's going to grip the ball much tighter. This guy also throws a heavy number of breaking balls. He's in supination more, so then he's having some flexor tightness the day after. But if I didn't know that it was raining and have a conversation around right. it, I'd kind of be freaking out because I'm like, okay, well, this could be an injury red flag. Let's problem solve what's going on. Is it mechanical? Is it physiological? What's kind of happening there? But those conversations are absolutely critical. And athletes themselves might miss that and not understand the, un the underlying function of why did this outing happen this way. Yeah, I think when they're honest with you, and also half, the, half of my job, I say in season, just offering like some positivity for guys, just because like, I was an assistant coach at college and the guy basically said an assistant coach's job is like offer positivity. He's going to have negativity from maybe how his performance was, his head coach. Like you can be 
a, like a beam of light for a guy that like needs some positivity through a rough stretch or like things aren't going well just like be a guy that he can talk to like whenever like don't be someone that like always when he comes to you there's like a negative response like this is what you're doing wrong we need to fix it it's like sometimes you just have to be like remind them that they're a dog and just like don't forget that like in the, season especially especially if they're if their own like internal like self-dialogue is negative if, if like certain some guys are very hard on themselves like i know mccullers is extremely self-critical so like he'll have like pretty good outing like a, like literally a quality outing but like he won't be happy with the movement profile on a certain pitch and you know in his mind it's like worst outing ever but in reality like decent outing there's some positive pieces to look at so if, if their own self-dialogue is just inherently very very critical that can be an important piece but then even if they're pitching well like you know, Clay, the first half of last year, like, was lights out. You know, maybe you're not changing anything. Maybe you're not, you know, routinely talking about what's going wrong. But you, you can still be, you know, again, a voice of positivity. You can be in their corner. You can say, like, all the work you put in the offseason is paying off. Like, and that's still a valuable role at that point in the season. Yeah, I feel like the best coaches never tie themselves to results on that front. Yeah, I know, like, Kyle Snyder came and visited with Tampa, and he is one of the most positive people you'll ever meet. And I think that it's, you know, there's no kind of secret there as to why Tampa's staff is probably so successful from him pumping positivity and, and athletes too. If you don't tie yourself to the results, like Clay was just in here throwing live last week and his first two balls in play were over 95 miles an hour. And like, what's he going to do? Freak out because he's a closer for the New York Yankees and two minor league guys just hit balls really hard off of him. No, like he trusts the process. He knows what he's doing and not tying himself to that short sample result. And if we can bring in that positivity, can change guys' careers. And this this brings me back to, I had a coach, uh, I'm not gonna mention names, but he basically uh, brought the entire staff together before the very first series of the season. And he said, I don't trust any of you guys here, except for this one guy. Like, y like I don't trust any of you guys, basically. And to me, that was like the worst thing you could possibly say to a staff right before their very first opening series is like, I don't trust you guys. I have no faith, no confidence in anybody. And you could tell with the way that he managed the staff. If if you got to if somebody got to a 2-0 count or 3-0 count, like you would literally see the entire like bullpen staff running down to start warming up. And it's just like the coach, any coaches listening to this can really positively or negatively impact the the overall confidence and culture of the staff based on the language that you use. And so him just telling us that he had no faith in any of us, like how would that series have maybe gone differently or had the season gone differently if he had had the, the mentality of like, you guys are dogs. Like, I want to see you just like go out and compete your ass off. Everything you do, like, I believe in you guys. Let's just compete your ass off. All the work, hard work we put in, like, let's fucking do it. Versus I don't trust any of you guys. So like, while on some on some level, like it's the, the pitcher themselves need to take accountability and be able to manage themselves regardless of what coach is kind of like on their team. The coach also does have a responsibility. A good coach can really help or hinder that process. I mean, how many guys have you seen in professional baseball now? They change environments with literally the exact same pitch profiles. Nothing changes at all, but they change environments and all of a sudden they're successful. Certain organizations acquire all these guys and put them in these environments and they succeed. And I think, you know, Devin and I are out here on the floor a ton together with our guys throwing and we're always going to put air in their tires and gas them up and, you know, make sure they feel good because it is a positive environment. The negativity in any sort of, you know, aggressive conversation we would ever have with an athlete happens well after that. It's never going to be in the moment, slamming it down their throat. We're going to step away from it and we're never going to cultivate an environment on floor while they're doing what they do where, you know, they're having self-doubt. Right. And that doesn't mean that we, you don't you don't give them constructive criticism or, you know, in the off season if they're showcasing a pitch that's just not, we just know isn't going to play in season that we don't tell them, hey, this, you know, frankly, this pitch sucks. We need to improve it. But it does mean when they're in the heat of the moment, when they're competing, when they're in season, like there does need to be a little bit of a shift towards the positive end of the spectrum, towards the confidence building end of the spectrum. I'll say that, like in the off season too, guys developing a pitch, that's like a perfect time for me to just be like, that's not good. Like, but in season, we have to like be able to tell them like objectively, this pitch isn't good. This is why you either need to bang it or you need to throw something else. And I think that's like, again, just offering perspective, objectivity, just being like, this isn't good, this is good, like, throw this more, like, be positive with guys. It's like a simple, I think, solution to, to a lot of issues guys run into. What are you guys' thoughts on changing, changing mechanics in season? Because I know from, from my standpoint, like, the higher the level the guy, the more cautious I am about, with anybody, it's like, changing mechanics in season is already a little bit dicey. 
but especially with the really high level guys where, where again there's not that much room for error i know there, there have been scenarios where like certain subtle tweaks do have to be made but what are your thoughts is that is that a last resort is that something you'll go to pretty pretty quickly if it's a very obvious issue i think if if they latch on to something subconsciously very 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 quickly then we can run with it if they're not latching on to it you know within seven to ten times or sessions of trying out something then we're not going to really force it but if they you'll find with a lot of guys and again we're also making an educated decision likely to backward chain something they had done really well before then if they latch onto that quickly we can we can roll it out i'll say too in the off season and early in the season when things are going well i'll have like a blueprint of what guys do well to look back on so i'll like in their video folder like text them and like remind them like this is the three things that you're doing when things are going well so in case like we run into the season like i've had a guy when he gets fatigued he doesn't get his flex with his spine he stands more upright it's like tall and his velo goes down three and so like i'll during the season be like remember what you're doing when you're throwing hard this is a focus and things are going well and a lot of the times it honestly it'll just work like most of the times you're making an educated enough decision where it's not going to be something that takes them a step or two back. It's going to be something that actually brings them forward because you've done a lot of work on the front, right. on the back end to get it there. So if it's something that they've done before in the past and it's reverting back to their own natural ideal patterns, like that's something that we'd be a little bit more comfortable with reverting to versus if it's trying to like shorten an arm action when they've never had a short arm action in their entire, in their entire life. Like major changes that they've never experienced before probably a no-go in season, but reverting back, like if this guy's always been a lower slot and you see him start to climb up in season, dropping down to his natural slot, probably a more, you know, manageable change. 100%. I think subconsciously, like if we use, if we use uh, Jameson's arm action, for instance, so he was really short and then naturally he blended to kind of like that moderate medium length, a little bit longer. Um, but I, I will say that's obviously subconscious for him. He's right. going to get into that. But I will say I have not seen too many big conscious adjustment patterning changes things go very well in season. Yeah, unless things are already going terribly to start and you have to make a change, I'd say it's not going to yeah. be something where it's like, you know, you're doing pretty well, like let's make a huge change in season. It's obviously going to be like guy by guy basis anyway. And like how much as a coach, you know, you can communicate with a guy because like some guys, you know, as a coach, like if you offer like even a little tweak, they're going to run with it way too far go down a rabbit hole and maybe screw themselves up for a couple weeks. So I think you have to do a lot of homework on the front end, knowing how to communicate with a guy, when to offer a piece of advice. And it's like, again, a lot of work on the front end, but it like pays off a ton when you know exactly what to do at specific times. It also comes back to, let's say we do notice a mechanical issue. Let's say, again, the, let's say maybe the arm is climbing up mm -hmm. and they used to be a little bit lower slot. We can just straight up tell them you need to drop your arm slot. That might work, it might not, because now they're thinking about it, now they're aware of it, now they're consciously like trying to like, change their slot or we can try to address the mechanics by somehow implementing a change in their like environment in their, or, yeah, in their throwing a drill routine or something yeah. like that so like, give them a drill don't, just don't even tell them, like hey we're gonna do a figure eight drill just try yeah. to be smooth and fluid and just see what happens now they're not thinking about it it's going to be a more subconscious uh change like that like curtis sailor with the elbow climbing and i know we were just talking about that with one of your athletes if you give him arm action freestyle tell him to just to unwind sidearm and a lasso and tell him to be a bit more horizontal on a figure eight, it's it's locked in in no time. I honestly think just like drill prescription for me is like the biggest thing where it's just like, mm -hmm. if you know the outcome that you want from a drill uh, or like what certain drills like long toss, you can get a guy more tilty or like things like that. Like I'll know a specific drill that I want to prescribe with a guy just to get him a different feel. Like I've had a guy just before he gets on the mound just pretend you're an outfielder and you're catching a fly ball and you're throwing it and that just gets his glove side up. It doesn't need to be like an active cue for him to like, hey, make sure you elevate that glove side. Just before you get on the mound, let's do a throw like you're an outfielder and then it seamlessly transitions to off the mound. So it's like right. little things like that where you know like what the outcome is gonna be if you like add a drill in or something so like that. So keep it as externally focused or subconscious as possible. Yeah. If, if you are gonna address mechanics and very, very last resort, maybe give them like the internal cue and in, like actively focus on it. In season, it's so tough because guys already are thinking about so many right. things. Just adding one more thing, like specifically internal mechanically, is just might be the tipping part where they go over the edge. But like adding a drill, they're just like, okay, yep. this feels good. Like I'll keep doing this. And then over time, you notice that the change is being made that you want. We've had so many case studies of fixing various patterning problems that we know, like you're talking about with drill prescription, 
generally we know with whatever said mechanical issue that we can give them two to three drills of X number of throws and it's likely going to sync itself up. Even just the balls that you're using, like overloads, underloads, you need to get a guy inside 90, just give him a heavier ball and he'll start to feel like the bicep turn on and start to you like actually get inside 90. Yeah. Like certain things like that, like coaches know what to prescribe and like the little details that yeah. need to happen. If a, if a guy's getting muscly, for instance, give him a give him a five ounce plyo ball and tell him to watch Ben Brewster throw. <laughs> yeah, that's literally. it, that's all it takes. Yeah, and I think that's another thing too with in season, like we have a lot of resources, not only coaches, but also athletes to use. Like specific, like you have Clay as like a sinker example. Like when I was trying to teach Mitch like a sinker in season, the first grip I gave was like Clay is like one of the best sinkers in baseball. Here's a three minute video on Clay explaining exactly the sinker grip. Like this is a place to start. So I think like using resources, especially like here is really important for not only co other coaches, but athletes too. So let's, let's shift gears. The kind of last thing I want to touch on is the weight training focus in season. So I know we kind of had a little bit of a shift philosophically a few years ago. Whereas before it's like, hey, should we just be like doing bare minimum, like still strength stuff, but just like very, very, very low volume, like just hit like two sets of, you know, six on everything, two sets of eight on everything. Or should we act actively be trying to make gains in power and speed where there's still not necessarily fatigue being induced, but hey, maybe we're like able to still like steal a little bit of power development, steal a little bit of speed development. Um, what are your guys thoughts on the focus in season? Should we be doing a little bit of strength work, just bare minimum maintenance, or should be, you know, maybe getting a little bit greedy and trying um, to get I think, faster well, as well. Anti-lifter can go first. <laughs> Anti-lifter. <laughs> but, so I was also going to say this, um, I, I definitely view it much, much differently across levels. So like high school, college, pro, I do view it very differently. Devin's hounding me about anti-lifting because I am pretty much all in on simply aligning fascia on the pro side, especially for high level guys who need to be ready each day. Like I think fascia's king and we just need to make sure you're feeling good there, things are aligned. But we can also use the weight room to kind of correct a few things. Like yesterday, Dev and I were talking about our clavicles and we were like, oh, well, if we're flattened out a little bit, if we need to adjust, maybe we do some more vertical pressing and we went down some rabbit holes, but we can utilize lifting things to then correspond to mechanics, which is great. On the high school end, I definitely think, um, with guys I've worked with recently at least, implementing some form of strength is obviously important. They get enough speed on the field. Most of those guys, if they're you know really high level athletes, they're likely playing shortstop or center field and they're pitching, they're hitting, they're getting enough speed work in. So then a, a bit more strength, but obviously program that out so that they have ample time to recover. On the college side, uh, depending upon the guy's profile, I feel like a lot of college guys are really strong right now, yeah. but they typically need some more speed work. Uh, if you're a weekend starter, you've got the best schedule in the world because you know when you're throwing every seventh day, and heck, you can even do some form of power and speed integrated in there between start to start. And then again, on the pro side, I am, I am very heavy on like the minimal dose, feel good, get what you need. But that minimal dose is different for everybody. Like uh, Jason Adam, for instance, he's a guy who short arm action gets the arm up early, has a really long vertical pec, does really well when he's when he's pressing a ton because his pec is a huge driver in his throw specifically for how he operates now. He likes lifting a bit heavier, so his minimum dose looks very different than another guy who's maybe you know a bit more elastic and is kind of springy, who's six foot, 170 pounds. So. But finding the minimum dose for each guy and how that pertains to them anatomically, physiologically, and then mechanically. Yeah, and a big piece of that is going to be actually communicating with them and monitoring their recovery. Because if you're just prescribed something and you have no no way of measuring or monitoring how they're doing, then you have you really have no idea. But if, let's say you start with a certain dose, a certain amount of lifting in season, and you're talking to them, you're communicating every week, and you start to see the velocity drop. Well, you know you might be doing too much. We can dial that. You know, it's all just a bunch of dials. We can dial that side of his programming down a little bit so that's that's one piece of it i know for me like i was able to even continue getting stronger in season until maybe like freshman year of college like until i had built like a pretty intermediate strength base like you know deadlifting 400 squatting 315 like until i got to some like intermediate numbers like i could i was still getting stronger in season so like it is possible certainly high school and like the very younger high college guys can get a little bit greedy especially if they're not like playing every single day like i wasn't getting a ton of playing time so i was getting after it pretty hard my first year of college but to your point like once a guy has you know 10 years of lifting history he's strong enough like these pro guys aren't going to be getting stronger in season so if you're in that range of like maximum recoverable volume minimum effective dose we'd much rather bias towards like the minimum effective dose side of the equation 
just to make sure they're as fresh as possible. Yeah, I'll say, like he said, different at each level. Like professional guys, and this is something that I noticed with Mitch actually, uh, he said he got, he did get stronger towards the end of the season, like focusing more on like his recovery in the weight room. And it actually led to like the velo being consistent throughout the course of the year. So in 2021, stopped lifting for like the last two or three months and then lost like two miles an hour. And it's just like, you have those timelines where it's like you can maintain strength for 30 days. So I think that's a big thing for like college guys, especially early in the season, maintaining that lifting volume, but also towards the end of the year, if you have three weeks left, you will maintain that strength for three weeks. So you don't need to be really selling out if you're like only have three weeks left of a college baseball season. I'll also say on the college side, the biggest limiting factor that I've seen from like even division one schools is never completing the transition. So they spend all this time in the off season doing hypertrophy strength work and they never actually move into like power or like speed stuff. They just go in season. And it's like you missed out on a big window opportunity early on in the, like the, the season to actually be moving things fast to then transition to like in season lifting. So it's like spending time there and also once you get in season, it's just like, what are you getting stimulus wise? Like if you're pitching every fifth day, or like every week, that's a big like speed stimulus. So it might be worth it to get some strength work in, like even out the both sides of the spectrum. You don't need to be doing like rapid, like peaking work maybe like every day because you're already getting 150 baseball throws in like on game days, higher effort. But it's like, like you said, fascia related training like that. It's, it's all about like what a certain guy needs every certain day and right. it kind of like all adds up and it's a lot easier to maintain strength than people think like it's, yeah. it's way easier than i realized until like much later on like most older pro guys understand this but like freshmen in college who like have been really getting after it like five sets of eight on squats all off season like the idea that like one heavy set would be enough is like laughable but like it probably is like if you had a couple heavy sets on a movement every week or every other week like your strength will maintain unless you're unless you're at the very 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 elite level where you're squatting like 600 pounds like maybe you're going to lose something but in general like any intermediate strength ranges once you've kind of built that base a lot easier to maintain than people think for you college guys out there when ben says heavy set it does not mean max out two days before a start because <laughs> it will affect your start like i ran into that issue my sophomore year of college where i had like the one heavy set i was like all right, I'll PR today. And like was absolutely crushed after like doing like 500 on deadlifts for five and then like trying to start two days later or like three days later being like, okay, my CNS is fried. So I think once you get in season, it's all about like nervous system management and like peaking on the days you're gonna have opportunities. Like one heavy set means like 80 to 90%. And you can do that over the course of a season and still like maintain your strength. That doesn't mean like, let's PR. Yeah, let's not, let's not do day. like AMRAP sets, you know, for like as many reps as you possibly can get with like, 90% one rep max or anything like that. Um, are there any lifts that you would definitely avoid in season? Like I know deadlifts or something we, if we do them, it's going to be more in like the low rep or, you know, power speed type ranges because it's so uh, fatiguing, like nervous system wise, but also from a grip standpoint, um, like other heavy, super heavy grip stuff, farmer's walks, like you'll, you'll have like strength coaches in college, like having guys do like farmer's walk competitions and like fat grip chin-ups like day before game stuff like that um, so outside of just keeping the grip fresh outside of you know loading up the spine with like 500 pounds um, anything else you guys see that you really try to avoid in season as far as programming um i don't know why this has happened recently but i've had a ton of guys doing heavy front squats mm -hmm. um, and so like one of the conversations i've had is obviously front squat requires a ton of anterior core stability um, and I don't know if it's always the best idea to heavily load that and have a ton of strain anterior core wise, and then try to go rotate as fast as possible. So I think kind of balancing that scale there. So for whatever reason, um, I've seen a ton of that recently. And I think to Devin's point, um, getting away from just specific lifts, but the phasing of lifts and understanding that, because I don't think college guys in particular understand that. Like they're doing eccentric front squats two weeks before a season and like the guy's hamstrings don't feel good on the mound. Like there's no coincidence. So I think the communication and the phasing, and I know we've put out material about this cause we give everything away and share so much knowledge, but being able to understand phases of lifting and how that's going to affect your performance and likely how you need to segue. That's an important topic that you probably do a podcast right. on in and of itself. Well, yeah. I mean, essentially the high, the higher the volume of your training, like the hypertrophy stuff, uh, and then also the eccentric focus stuff, that's gonna induce the most soreness, like for anybody watching. Like if you're gonna do heavy eccentrics in season, you're gonna be sore. It's it's really not the best, it's, that goes for conditioning too, like for any sort of speed and conditioning uh, selections in season, like 
you can just do like sprints, like sprints on the field. That's going to have a lot more eccentric stress, make you much, make you more sore than doing something like a, a sled sprint or a stationary bike sprint where there's no eccentric, there's no deceleration. So that's not, you're not getting that soreness inducing piece of it. I'll so. say like, yeah, like uh, medicine ball and like uh, lumbar spine, like rotational work, like in season probably don't need to do a ton of because you're rotating so much. So like a guy doesn't need additional like, you know, scoop toss 15 reps if you're getting like a hundred every time you throw, like maybe limiting the rotational work, maybe some lat stuff, like making sure you're going full range of the lat stuff, not like half reps. Those would be the two things that I would add on like individual exercises. like limit the rotation outside of baseball because you're getting such a stimulus from that. And then like the lat work, like make sure you're going like full, full range on all of that. And the other two things I would add is really monitoring the, monitoring your range of motion, like especially like shoulder flexion, um, especially like posterior cuff tissue quality, uh, you know, supination, you know, basically everything you're using as an accelerator throughout the season will have a tendency to kind of get short shortened toned up tight dense so like a tendency to lose supination as the pronator gets really overworked tendency to lose shoulder flexion as the lat starts to get a little bit tight tendency to lose some internal rotation and just like really feel tight and gritty through the back of the shoulder i think that like even the arm care app is a good tool to have just in season to monitor like range of motion but also strength because i think some guys like don't pay attention to like the external rotation strength they're losing over time because as you know, like the more throwing you're getting, your body's gonna trend more towards ER, less towards IR, and they're gaining range of motion and external rotation, but maybe they're losing on strength because they're not getting a lot of work in there. So just like monitoring that over the course of like a longer season. And to go back to your supination point of specificity, obviously related to data, we encourage guys to throw a, a heavy number of breaking balls. And one thing you'll see prominent in major league clubhouses is guys likely doing end range supination work and bicep curls because they know that supination is how they make their money. They need to be able to throw off speed, but you know, especially college guys, high school guys, they might not understand what's going on there. You know, why is my breaking ball getting worse? Why am I having elbow discomfort? But to back chain and problem solve those things is so valuable in season. Yeah, yeah and I, I like that you mentioned the arm care app there. Um, one thing that you didn't mention is that it really helps from a fatigue management standpoint. So you know, from, from a coach's standpoint, like you can literally have all your guys like on a dashboard monitoring their, their strength before outings or before bullpens, after outings, after bullpens. And you can literally see the delta, the change between when they're fresh and when they're fatigued. And you can see what the drop off is. And if that drop off is, above, you know, beyond a certain point, you can basically infer that that was an overly fatiguing, you know, outing or, you know, throwing session for that specific athlete. And then you can know to back off a little bit for the next time. So you can manage your guys, you know, fatigue levels Obviously on the front end, you can manage their workload and you know, not put them out there for 150 pitches for a start. But on the back end, you can see like, okay, maybe he only threw 40 pitches, but it was extremely fatiguing for his arm for whatever reason, recovery, sleep, like his arm is just not bouncing back as well. And you can see that all on the dashboard within the arm care app. I like it with the arm crap. If guys don't have access to that, like some sort of readiness, like formula for a guy, like whether it's like a grip strength test or like a vertical jump test, like I like that to kind of see how the training is working with the guy in season. Like if he's, you know, doing a, you know, vertical jump test two days after a start day and like he's down or like maybe in game, if you have access to track or something like that, spin rates down. It's just like little things like that. You can notice that a guy is like trying to trend towards fatigue. So maybe as a coach, as an athlete, just like notice those little changes so that, you know, you don't wonder what happened a month down the line when you're running into injury because yeah. you didn't manage fatigue better. And that, that also will set up your entire schedule moving forward based upon day one or day two soreness. Like I know for myself in college, I could go throw 120 pitches on Friday night and I could long toss max distance Saturday. Sunday would come around and, and I would I would just play light catch to like 60, 90 feet. But I always felt a bit more sore on day two. So therefore, my training schedule should look drastically different segueing back to my bullpen on Tuesday. And so once you, you have to know that with guys and regulate it in order to successfully build out their entire schedule. And you're not gonna know that day one. Like you're, you're not gonna know that. You, you figure this out through trial and error and through talking to the athletes and, and problem solving. If, if he tells you, if you start to realize that he's a, he's a 48 hour soreness guy, now that might adjust when his, his next bullpen happens. That might happen, you know, when does his lower body lift happen? When does his upper body lift happen? Huge. Um, even further to that point in professional baseball, there is a huge problem with guys on a five day rotation where for so long, for whatever reason in professional baseball, it's been known that day two, you throw your, throw your side. So guys are out there throwing their side, just hanging throwing at 70% effort, putting in terrible mechanical compensations, 
just to get through the bullpen. And then you, you wonder why so many injuries are happening. And that's a huge part of it from a starter's perspective. I think that's something that has helped, like having a guy in the off season, you can kind of manage that stuff ahead of time. Whereas like in season, it's all about communication up front with like, if you're just getting a new guy in season, like how do you usually feel? What's your soreness look like? But I think guys know it, but I think it, it takes you asking them to be able to like realize it. Like right. they, some guys will like know they're sore, like usually the second day after, but they won't ever like actually figure out like, maybe let's not throw the second day and let's, you know, get our work in like long toss a day after, like until you finally ask them. So I think that's another important thing is like knowing what to ask guys because usually guys have the answers in their head has never like been processed before. Right. I, th I think some, some athletes think they can do it all on their own, but others just like fully just, they follow everything we put out to a T and then they don't ever communicate with us. And they're just like, oh, like we have some magic crystal ball where like we just know exactly what you need to do just like magically. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Like this is a collaborative effort. Like we, you're gonna get more out of it the more you put into it. The more you talk to us to share information, share how you're feeling, share how you're recovering, share your, your mental state during the outings, what you're trying to accomplish, the better we can actually program around that and make adjustments. Because we can, again, we can't feel what you're feeling. We can't get in your head until you communicate that to us. So we don't have this magic, magic crystal ball. Like I'll have guys that just text me one video, one like side view from a bullpen nothing else and i'm like what am i supposed to do with this yeah. i don't know how your outing went i don't like especially if it's like a college guy or a high school guy i don't have like access to a lot of that data i don't know how you're feeling i don't know how your arm feeling i don't know how you recovered i don't know anything like about the outing just from the, the mechanics and so they think that we just like can infer everything from like this one video and it doesn't work that way and and you have to have those conversations to figure out their best schedule and sometimes that involves going against the grain of what they previously thought uh, like I know I have an athlete right now who had a lat surgery over a year ago. Velocity had been way down. His velocity has gotten up a little bit, but after high effort throwing sessions, he takes a bit to recover. Well, turns out I had a conversation with Glasnow not long ago about him basically centering all of his focus to mound specific work. And like, if he doesn't feel great, he might throw five to 10 pitches on like day three, but then he's just getting ready for his next start. And I was talking to this guy about this and I was like, hey, you don't, there's, there's no written rule that you have to throw aside on day two or day three on a five day rotation. Like you can go long toss, feel good, throw five to eight off the mound and get ready for your next start. Just if we're scaling pitch count and your starts, there's, there's no prerequisite that you have to throw a bullpen in between those. So sometimes you have to go against the grain to figure out what a guy needs. Again, coming off lat surgery, we don't want him to compensate low elbow, you know, He's not going to do well throwing at low effort. So you've got to, you got to have that conversation. And you have to individualize each guy. Like that's where I think a, a coach of a school or a coach in a professional organization might have a philosophy that they apply to every guy. Whereas we kind of just go subjective. Each individual guy is going to get their own thing. And we don't like, we're not affiliated with any like organization where we have to apply these concepts. It's just like whatever is going to work for the guy is going to work. And we can apply that to that guy's training or that guy's throwing. I can think of two other examples of things where, you know, in my personal career and just like talking to players like really did impact recovery in season as well. One is just like excessive speed and conditioning work, like for whatever reason. And my, my theory about this is that strength and conditioning coaches at college ranks and also in the pro ranks, like their job, like they have like one job. And so they want to do their one job really, really well. And so like every single day they get, have to have something for the players to do. And so what ends up happening is like players run every single day. And, you know, thankfully the, the paradigm has shifted from long distance running to more sprint work as, as it should for the most part. The problem is that it's still like six or seven days a week of sprints is still too much. So you'll have players that have shin, like the ones who actually go hard and, and like do it full out, they all have shin splints, they have dead legs, like they're just neurologically not recovered because the strength coach needs to get his, you know, needs to get his say in and like everyone has to do their daily sprint work. But he's not actually ever communicating with the guys how they're feeling. Because if he was, he would realize two to three days is plenty or even one to two days is plenty. Like we're not trying to, what are we actually measuring here? Like if we were trying to get their six, are we trying to get your 60 time down in season? Are we trying to get your resting heart rate down? Like if, if there's actually a measurable outcome here that we're going for, let's measure it. But if we're just running for the sake of running, if we're just doing sprint work for the sake of doing sprint work, which is 99.9% .9 of the time, like, what are we really doing here? And so I would just urge anybody watching this, like, to kind of reconsider and see, like, is that, does that scenario apply? Because I know for me, for myself in pro ball, like, all the players know this. 
no one wants to speak up and actually say this to the strength and conditioning coach because you know suddenly that's like infringing upon like what they've been hired to do but in reality like maybe what the players need is less sprinting because it's, you don't need six or seven days a week of sprinting it comes back to like taking a step back looking at the big picture as an athlete or if, if you aren't willing to do that or know that you're going to overthink it if you do get a coach to do that for you like get a coach like make your life simpler so you don't have to have like what am i doing lifting wise what am i doing running wise what am i doing throwing wise like have someone either program that for you or if you can handle it like take a step back and look at everything that's going into what the season looks like and not just on the mound in a game because i think that's where a lot of people run into issues they're only taking into account that stress and not workload of an entire like life what are your guys thoughts on pitchers like just being at the field all day, like shagging BP, like you're pretty much on your feet six straight hours. Because I know that's another piece of it for me where just like being in the sun constantly, like especially like in Arizona, you're like just standing out on the field all day. You're in 100, 100 degree, 110 degree heat. I don't know if there's a better alternative to doing that, but what are your thoughts on that? Like, should pitchers be able to get to get their work in? I know a lot of big leaguers, like especially on rehab assignments, they'll they'll show up, they'll get their work in, they'll leave. Is that a realistic scenario for most colleges, most yeah, professional teams? I, I think um, at least uh, one of the biggest things you can do as a as a minor league guy, obviously in the big leagues, they've got it figured out. College, etc. A very subtle thing is to literally get out of your cleats. Uh, like one thing I've noticed over and over is college guys are shagging with cleats on some minor league guys, but you know, the burden of actually being on your cleats for three, four, five, six hours is excruciating. So getting out of those, I know uh, the joke is always before spring training, go get your cleats on and stand on concrete for like four right. hours right. to prepare yourself. But seriously, like it does, it does take a burden on you. Um, but I think, doing what you can to get off of your feet, get out of heat, rest and recover, different recovery modalities. And something that you always say, um, and I certainly firmly believe in, is the hydration piece of that. Like hydration is so important with how your fascia is gonna work and so many soft tissue injuries can be prevented if you are hydrated. Yeah, I have to get on guys to make sure to take electrolytes in season, especially if, if I know it's a guy who's in Florida, in Arizona, and they're just communicating like, I'm fatigued. Like my velo's like you. You without fail, you'll get this text a few times a year. My velo's down. I feel really, really fatigued. I just feel like I'm moving in slow motion. I don't know what to do. And so like you can't just say like do X Y Z. You need to like ask them a bunch of questions and figure out like okay, how are you sleeping? How's your caffeine intake? Are you taking you know way too much caffeine? Like you know, and a lot of times it actually ends up being like a combination of multiple different pieces. But the electrolytes is is a big piece of it. This is the hydration. But again, it's not just water intake, it's actually getting the electrolytes with that. Yeah, and I like that you touched on the mental side too, like especially, I know for, even for myself, and you probably had the same thing, you pitch in a game that night, let's say you're a reliever, you enter the game at 9, 9.30, it is so hard to turn your brain off by midnight because you're, you're just running. Um, and so finding different ways to cope with that, having certain routines to allow you to get to bed, the environment you set for your sleep. Like I think all those things are massive and guys, never think about it like they're like oh well now that i look back i actually went out with a few teammates to a restaurant and like didn't get in until like 1 a.m and i don't know didn't sleep great woke up at eight or nine so all these things come into play and people never think about it or they know the one player who you know the best player on the team can get away with you know being out till 2 a.m or having a few beers or whatever it ends up being like the best player can do it why can't we all do it well generally the guys that do that aren't the guys who last for 15 years in the big leagues. Like they might last for three, four, five years, but typically like that stuff does catch up to most people. Unless again, you're just like the outlier to the rule. Right. So taking care of yourself as much as you possibly can. Uh, definitely a big piece of it. Having a coach in your corner to problem solve any issues that come up along the way, you know, staying in the kind of minimum effective dose range as far as your training and your throwing. Um, and then just being able to problem solve issues as they, as they come up. Um, but hopefully people got something out of that podcast. And again, any questions for us, definitely leave those comments down below. And I appreciate your time. I know we lost Devin here a few minutes ago, but uh, he's got to go coach. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and see you guys next time.